So have your Bible, 2 Timothy 4 is where we're going to start today. 2 Timothy 4 is where we're going to start today. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be there, and it's going to be on the screen, and we're going to read it all, then we're going to come back and make some points. Here it is. Verse 1, Paul's writing, he's writing to this man named Timothy. Timothy is a young pastor, and he wants to speak to Timothy and, 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 and say, hey, come along, get where I am, and, and, and he starts with you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Verse 2, preach the word. He's telling a pastor, hey, get ready to preach. Preach. Speak about Jesus all the time. Be ready in season, out of season. So that means be ready when it's time and when it's not time. Be ready to preach. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, and com- with complete patience and teaching. Verse 3, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Verse 5. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. It's it's Paul just pouring some stuff out on, on a man that he loves, on a man that he cares about, to say, hey, become a great pastor. Do the things that, that make for being a great pastor. Do the things that bring honor to Jesus. And then verse 6 is kind of this, this self-eulogy that Paul gives. It goes like this. For I am already being, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Here's the thing. Paul lived an extraordinary existence. He lived an extraordinary existence. He was an intelligent man. He was, pro- he was one of the most brilliant men of the day. He knew, he, he, he studied and he knew, and he studied at the feet of the greatest teacher of the day. He grows up and, 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 and he lives inside of Judaism and he is strongly zealous for, for Judaic principles. So strongly zealous that when this Jesus and his followers come on the scene, what, what Paul does is, his name is Saul at that point, he starts going around finding them, pulling them off, persecuting them, killing them, seeking to destroy the church. And then uh, in this amazing story in Acts 9, if you wanted to look there, he, uh, he's, he's on his way to, to go destroy some more Christians, pu- go pull some more out of their homes and, and kill them. And, and, and Jesus knocks him off a donkey, blinds him, and says, why, why are you trying to go against me? Why are you pushing against me? And he's blinded. Later, he, he, he trusts. And from that moment on, Saul becomes Paul, and Paul lives this extraordinary existence because he lives focused. He lives not about the moment at hand, but seeing what's out there. Living for something bigger. Number one on your handout, if you're going to write, take notes today, is what Paul did is he valued he valued a vision bigger than himself. And if you want to have this extraordinary life, you want to live something amazing, something that lasts eternally, if you want to do that, then you and me, we've got to get a vision, and we've got to value it. We've got to value a vision for something bigger than us. Look at verse 6 again. He goes this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. What he's, what he's saying is, I am about to die. I know I'm about to die. And you know what you don't hear in his voice? Regret. He's, he's lived his life for something bigger. He's understood that, that, that he, is, he is going after the cause of the gospel. That he has planted churches all over the known world. That he's written most of the New Testament. And now he's dying. And you know what? What he said over and over again throughout the scripture is, yeah, this life is fine, but dying is gain. I'd rather be with Jesus. 
He had, he had a vision of what mattered. He valued a vision higher than himself. And so when death came, okay. I mean, and for Paul, like, he, he, he got, he was stoned multiple times. He was beaten multiple times. This guy was thrown out of towns multiple times. And this man dusted himself off and kept going. He valued a vision bigger than himself. Now, I mean, you, you see this all the time in, like, companies. You see a company, a company that, that grows really well. I, I, I'm a big reader. I, I, I think I've read every book Jim Collins has written, books that Malcolm Gladwell writes. I love those books. I love that, that kind of thinking. And with those, a lot of what those books are about, especially Jim Collins' books, is about how you build an enduring great company. It's, it's how you take a company and take it from nothing or take it from something that's moderate to, and, and building it to something great. And, and you read that stuff, and you're like, oh, these leaders, they had these, this vision, and they had this understanding, and they were going to push forward. These, these level five leaders who didn't value themselves, they valued the vision of the company. They, they valued this stuff more than they valued them. But here's the thing about a company, is there's no company that's been around since the foundation of the world. You know what I mean? Is, is every, every business has its end. Every pursuit ends. Every thing that we go after, every big thing that we set our minds and hearts towards, eventually that thing ends. Maybe it ends 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, but eventually the thing is, is that thing is measured by years. That thing is measured by time. Paul's vision, Paul think, the thing that Paul values is something that's not measured by time. He values the gospel. He values eternity. What will matter long term? And my challenge for you this year, my challenge for me this year, is that you would think, live, focus, value, eternity. Value what God has done in eternity past to call you to himself. And value what he's doing now in this time span that James calls of our lives are like vapors. And to see that there's something more that's coming like that it doesn't terminate now, but that you can live for something bigger, lasting, more meaningful. Value a vision bigger than yourself. Number two, look, in, look at verse seven. This is where Glenn, Glenn talked a little bit about, and I, and I loved what he had to say. Verse seven says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What do you fight for? What are the things that you fight for? Like, there's a lot of times you'll just let it roll off your back, right? Because there's stuff that just doesn't matter. There, there's stuff that, you know, the, the mailman, they, they didn't bring the mail the, the right day, or the, or, the, or the package didn't get brought when it was supposed to get brought. It doesn't matter. It just rolls off. Or maybe for you it doesn't. Maybe you're type A and everything matters all the time. What, what do you fight for? My boys, they, uh, they love to fight for, for the, the police Lego man. We, you think we'd get smarter and just buy only police Lego men, but we're not that bright. Maybe you can buy this for us. That'd be awesome. It's hard to find just police Lego men, by the way. They'll fight over that because that matters to them. What do you fight for? What, 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 do you, what do you fight over? Sometimes it's your marriage. Like, I'm fighting hard for my marriage. I want my marriage, I want my marriage to be stronger, so I'm going to fight hard to, ma to make it stronger. Or, I don't want my marriage to end, and so I'm going to fight for it, for it to be strengthened. What are you fighting for? 
Those things are fine and good. You should fight for those things. Oh, I, I, I want to fight for the stuff that matters. I want to fight to help my family. I want to fight. Do that. Fine. Good. But what Paul's talking about is he's fighting for something that he knows matters. He's fighting for something that, that, that is never going to end. He's fighting the good fight. He's fighting for what he knows is going to go on into eternity. City View Church, I want you to fight. I want you to fight for what goes on into eternity. I want to challenge you this year to really take seriously people in your lives who don't know Jesus. I want you to chat. To to, to, we, we talk about top 10 lists all the time in here. Who's on your top 10 list? Who are the people you're praying for? Who are those people? And I want to challenge you in a big way this year. You write that thing and you pray for those people and don't just pray for them. Share the gospel with them. Because we're going to fight for stuff that matters all year long. You're going to fight for raises. You're going to fight to keep your job. You're going to fight for your marriage. You're going to fight for the growth of your kids. You're going to fight for that stuff. Fight. Good. Fine. Good. Awesome. Fight for the gospel to take root in someone's life. Fight that, fight that we're going to have baptisms every month here. Fight that our tank, our, our crazy little horse trough that we have up here, that's so heavy to push. Fight, fight that one day. Fight that that thing is filled all the time. Not by people that, that you don't know, who just kind of show up here and maybe Jason won them to Christ or somebody I don't know, maybe, maybe Pastor Travis won them to Christ and they're here and they're getting baptized. That's awesome. We should be happy about that. But you, what if you fought for that? What if, what if you took the gospel to someone this year and by God's grace they would believe? What, 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 if, what if you did that? What if you saw someone who was far from God come near to God by the blood of Jesus? What if that happened? And it was your neighbor. And it was your sister. It was your son. It was your husband. What if? We fight for things all the time that don't matter. We, 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 you call customer service, you're going to fight to get $10 off of your cable bill, right? Which, I mean, it's Comcast, so you need to. Xfinity, stop trying to rebrand. We know who you are, really. <laughs> Save money, that's fine. That, maybe that's part of your larger goal. Good, no problem, whatever. Fight for something that matters. Make it substantive. Not substantive to, to, that the bottom line in your month, things are better, but substantive for eternity for that person. That hell wouldn't be their home, but heaven would be. City View Church has to exist to make going to hell hard in Pearland. And the members of City View Church, City View Church isn't Jason Crandall. City View Church is, is you. It's the covenant people of City View Church. Those people have said, we're going to come together for a vision broader than ourselves. Make your top ten list. Take it seriously. Don't get derailed by the other stuff. Make it a point. It, I mean, spend five minutes a day praying for them. Talk to someone. Build relationship. We can talk about this in, in months to come, but Make it, as you're writing goals, maybe write this goal. That I'd fight for the eternity of someone else. Number three. Verse seven again. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Next week, I won't be here. Next week, I'm running a half marathon. I know, I'm excited. Yeah, Maritza back there, she's running the full, don't brag. Uh, just kidding, I'm excited for her too. Running the half marathon. This is a goal I put out two years ago. I wrote it down, I said, I want to run a half marathon. It was, it was uh, 2014, I said, I want to run it by the end of the year. 
Well, I uh, didn't make it. I got injured. I, I, I twisted my ankle, which I'm sure, uh, if you know me well, that's a surprise. <laughs> I've probably twisted my ankle 10,000 times in my life. I got these crazy bad shin splints, like so bad that I felt like my shin was going to break in half. But it was in October of, la- of, that, of uh, 2014 that I got them, and I, and I was like setting personal bests every day. I was running faster than, I mean, not fast compared to like some of you guys, but I would say like I was getting places. I felt like I was making these huge strides, but, but my shins were like breaking in half. And I was, I was taking like three or four ibuprofen before a run so that it would feel good while I was running. And then some Aleve after the run and some more ibuprofen after the run to make sure that... that and so eventually my liver started to hurt a lot. Um, and then I realized my shoes were bad. I pronate. I don't know. Runners know what that word is. No one else does. Whatever. It means my feet go in. Um, and after that, I just quit for about five months. So uh, after October, my, I had so much pain, I just quit for, oh, December, January, February, March, April. And about that time, I recalibrated and said, no, you know what? I want to get it going again. So I bought good shoes. I bought a Brooks. I'm a Brooks glycerin person, if you're, if you're a runner. And uh, got out there and started running. And was a little smarter this time. Found, actually talked to people who had done it before. And figured out that, oh, wait, you can't run every day or else you're going to hurt yourself <laughs> like I did. And, uh, and then here's the crazy thing. I broke my foot. Fertilizing my grass. <laughs> Who's proud of Jason? Thank you. Two back there. None of the rest of you, though. They're on my good list. The rest of you, minus one. And it was hard to get back out after six weeks of not doing anything. But I knew it's what I needed to do. For my health. For my mental state. Like, I didn't want to sit down and say, I failed at this. And so it got hard. But here's the thing. You can't quit when it gets hard. Because everything worth doing is going to get hard at some point, right? Everything worth doing gets hard at some point. Kids, the idea of having children is so wonderful. I remember uh, in 2006, Allie and I had been married about 16 months or so. And we went to uh, lunch with friends of ours who go to this church, the Betchers, their members, and, and they had uh, their, uh, and, and, and they had just gotten married, and then right afterwards, they found out they were pregnant. And like, shocker, right? Like, you just get married, now you're pregnant, so boom, there's baby, it's coming, exciting for the, kind of exciting, scary for them. They tell us when we're, we go out to lunch with them, and on the way home, Allie says, Jason, I really want to have a baby. I'm like, what? That's ridiculous. But she did not relent. (laughs) And the thought, like that thought was just, like she loved it. And then I started to love it. I was like, you know what? I love a little Jason Jr. running around here. (laughs) And the thought like became an intoxicating thing. Like, like, hey, we're going to, we're going to get somewhere. We're we're, we're, going to go and we're going to have this baby. And, and, then, and then he was born. And here, like, I don't know if you know this or not, but babies don't sleep right when they're born. They scream for a long time. And then they get circumcised, and you don't realize you can give them Tylenol or whatever. You don't have to take, and then they scream all night long. And then you're ready to, like, I don't know. Run, run, I don't know, it was scary. We didn't know what to do firstborn, and we're, we're freaking out. And, and then, you know what, it just like, it, keep, it keeps getting harder. 
but it's worth it. It's worth it to see that baby who screamed in our room, running around here, talking to me last night about, about Jesus and, and, and excited about being baptized soon, seeing, his gra- seeing him get good grades on his report guard and, and, and seeing all that and knowing that the labor that it took to get there was abundantly worth it, and it's going to get harder. I don't think that, I know that I'm not done. We have teenage years to go. That's going to be crazy. We've got two more behind him who are likely going to be crazier. But it's worth it because they're wonderful. Everything worth doing is hard. Everything worth doing is hard. Don't quit. This is Paul. He's at the end of his life. He's saying, I have finished the race. I've done it well. I've run hard for the sake of the gospel. Yes. Run hard for the sake of the gospel. Don't quit when it gets hard because you're going to make that list of people. Ten people, you're going to start praying, and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to white knuckle it. You're going to grip hard and say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to win people to Jesus this year. I'm going to see somebody saved. I'm going to do that. That's going to be, that's going to be me. And then you're going to share the gospel with someone, and they're going to look at you like you're crazy. You're going to want to quit. But everything worth doing gets hard. But you, you look at the finish line. You look at the end of the race. You look at what's coming. And you know it's worth it. City View Church, don't quit when it gets hard. Don't quit. Push hard. It's worth it. Next. Verse 7 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Number four is this. Hold tight to the one who holds you. Do you know what faith is? I sat down with Drew the other day, and and we were talking about faith. So at night, what Drew and I do is we kind of we have theological conversations. So you can ask him about the Trinity. He'll explain it to you perfectly. He's fantastic. Just kidding. No one can understand it completely, but he's great. He remembers everything I say, which is scary. Um, and we were talking about faith. So we were talking about what does it mean to have faith? And I said, all right, Drew, so you have a bed, right? And he said, yeah, I have a bed. And, and, and when you run in your room and jump on your bed, are you ever worried that bed's going to break? He said, well, Dad, you built it, so maybe. No, he didn't say that. He gets in the bed and he says, no, I don't ever think about it. Because the bed's capable of holding you. The bed's capable of holding you up. You don't even think about it. You put your faith in the bed to be there. Maybe you came in here and you looked at, you didn't, I bet you didn't examine the chair for its strength. I, I bet you didn't look at the legs to see if, well, I don't know. I put on a couple pounds over the holidays. I bet you just sat down. Now you're like, these chairs aren't very comfortable, but I sat down. That's faith. Faith isn't how strong you are. Can I say that? Faith isn't how strong you are or how strong your, you grip. Faith is how strong the thing that you're putting it in is. If you are... If you were in a, a, we went rafting in Colorado this summer, uh, really like level two, like it was barely rippling, but we went. And, and what, the, what the guide said while we're going through there is, is if you were to fall out, and I'm thinking, how are we possibly going to fall out of this thing? But if you were to fall out, get to the rock and like get to a rock and, and get on top of the rock, like be there and get on something that's sturdy. Don't, don't try to grab onto a limb 
Because that limb might break. Get to something that's sturdy that's going to hold you. We put our faith in stuff that matters. We put our faith in stuff that's going to hold us. We put our faith in things in th- that are going to hold up our weight. And when we talk about our eternal soul, we put our faith in stuff in a person who can hold it. City of your church, put your faith in Christ this year. Realize that the one who holds you is capable to keep you. John 10, he, he, Jesus is talking about how no one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. Once, you, once you've trusted Jesus, once you're there, no one can take you out. You're safe. You're locked. You're secure. You're there. Put your faith in something that matters. Someone who matters. Someone who can hold you. Don't put your faith in, in your money-making abilities. Because it's going to fail. Because oil industries drop. Banking industries go down. The stock market dips. Don't put your faith there because it's not worth it. It can't hold you. Don't put your eternal faith in another person. Because no man, ladies, listen, no man is going to be perfect. I thought I'd get more amens from women like that, but yeah. Maybe amens from men, I don't know. No man is perfect. They, they aren't going to be able to please you in every way. Men, no woman is perfect. Except my wife. No, no, none of them. None of them are. None of them are. Your kids, they're lovely, beautiful creatures. Wonderful. They're going to fail you. Put your faith in something that matters. And then hold tight to it. Don't let it go. Don't run away. Hold on. Number five. Seek the prize. He goes on like this. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Paul's got an eye on the prize. He wants this crown. He sees this crown. Now here's the thing. It's not his righteousness. It's Jesus' righteousness that he gets. He gets it. Jesus gives it to him the day that he trusts in Christ. He gets Christ's righteousness, but now he gets to see it. He gets to grip it. He gets to hold on to it. Now he's getting the crown. See the goal. Get a picture of the goal. Understand where you're going to, what, what God might be calling you towards. Get the picture and go after it. Realize it's, it's not just this life. In fact, it's so much more than this life. Number six. Love Jesus authentically. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Here, and not just Paul, all right, not just Paul. You're, you might read that, read that and say, all right, yes, Paul, he wrote lots of the New Testament. He won, won lots of people to Jesus. He's super Christian. He's probably got a cape, and he's going church to church, and people are like, oh, Paul's awesome. Ah. It's not just for him, though. This prize isn't just for him. This prize is for not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This prize is for everyone who authentically trusts in Christ. This prize is for you if you've put your faith in Christ. Now, I talked a lot to believers in this room already. Believers looking to see people come to know Christ. Don't quit. Push forward. But here, maybe a second for people who don't know Jesus. Maybe you're just checking out the claims of Christ. Maybe, maybe you're just like, what is this church all about? What is God all about? What is the... I don't get this. Let me tell you, number one, City View Church is a safe place for you to ask questions and to, and to figure things out. 
City View Church is a place where you can come and, 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 and see what's going on. We're going to worship God. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to read out of the Bible. We're going to explain it well. We're going to try to live in community. We're going to do the things that God calls us to do as best we can. That's what we're going to do. And you are safe to be here. You're safe to ask any question you have. If you're seeking about the, the truth claims of God, you're seeking, is, is this real or is this not real? You are are welcome here. We'd love to answer questions. But the thing that we're going to call you to over and over again is for you to put your faith in Jesus. That you would love him authentically. That, that your heart, your mind, your soul would be resting not on yourself, but on someone who came, who lived a perfect life, who died on a cross for sin, who entered the grave for three days and then rose again. We're going to call you over and over and over again to put your faith in this man because he's the only one who's worth it. And we're going to call believers over and over again to continue to put their faith in this man. that the regular flow of a believer would be to repent and believe the gospel. To be repent and believe the gospel. Believer, you need to repent and believe the gospel. And person who doesn't know Jesus, you've got to repent of sin and believe the gospel. This Jesus who came loves you completely. He gave his life that you would have eternal life. City View Church, I think 2016 is going to be a great year. I want you to live extraordinary lives. I want to share with you something that I'm hoping to, to push us towards, to, to see maybe happen for us this year. On the way out today, you're going to get a prayer guide. Uh, this prayer guide is just going to go over for the next four weeks. It's going to end on February 7th. On February 7th, what we're going to do is, we're, that's our anniversary service. We can celebrate two years of being a church together. That's going to be awesome, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, get to celebrate, we get to celebrate two churches that have been sent this year. One of them, a, a City View Collective Church and, and City View Alvin. We get to celebrate that. It's awesome. We can celebrate people who have come to know Jesus here. We can celebrate all that God's done. We're looking forward to that day. But a thing that we're going to be asking you to pray for over the next four weeks, think about it, over the next four weeks, and then we're going to kick off on the seventh, is we're going to start, I'm nervous. We're going to start a capital campaign. We're, we, we want to not live in a school forever. <laughs> this has been good for us, and if this is where God would have us for the rest of our lives, Awesome. But Travis and myself have been praying, and leadership teams have been praying, and finance teams come around us and, and has agreed, and, and, and we're going to kick off a, a capital campaign on February 7th. What's a capital campaign, Jason? It's, it's, a, it's a place and time for us. We're trying to raise some extra cash to be able to purchase some land. Purchase some land so that City View Church, not, okay, let me say this, not so City View Church has land, Okay but so that City View Church can demonstrate to Pearland community that we are here for the long haul for the sake of the gospel. Does that make sense? We don't want to buy land just to have land, okay? If we just have land, awesome. But what do we do with it? We want our land to be for the sake of the gospel. Whatever we put on that land one day, we want to use it for the sake of the gospel. Whatever we do with these things, we want to do it for the sake of the gospel. Does that make sense? And that from this place, from whatever we end up building, I don't know, maybe, maybe we buy land and we, we wait five years to build. I don't know, maybe we build within a year. Who knows? But We are going to be a place where people are going to hear the gospel, know who Jesus is and what he's done, and where we're going to be continuing to send churches. Excited for Joe. We've started to make our plans to send Joe at the end of November, early December for him to start pushing out uh, and commission him in 2016. 
But my, my ask for you today is that you start praying. Start praying about this campaign, about what might God have you do in the middle of this. Because it's not about us. We're not doing this for us. We want to see people reached for the sake of the gospel. We want to see this vision of a filled baptistry all the time. Of churches planted throughout Houston. So that Jesus is made much of and his name is renowned. Amen?